Hi, I'm Andrew Cagney and I'm here to talk about Librespot. This talk is part of BSD CAN 2020. This year, obvious reasons, it's all gone virtual. So what are we going to look at? First, Librespot, what is it? It's an Ike daemon, an internet key exchange daemon, and then why is it of interest to NetBSD and the BSD community more broadly? So let's get down. So first of all, what is and why use an internet key exchange daemon? Let's do an example using Librespot. What about a problem? Let's go with three. Problem one, you have two endpoints and you want to make sure that all the traffic between the two endpoints is encrypted. No ifs, no buts. Any traffic going between those two, encrypt it. That's called transport mode. The next problem is a bit more complicated. It's where you have you know, say a corporation and they have two routers on the internet they don't want to pay expensive private landlines if you can even get them nowadays and for them they will have two gateways and the gateways will take all the internal traffic and tunnel it through to the other end where it will get decrypted and then it can fly around again of course any sane corporation is also running SSL everything else it's another layer of security. Finally, it's problem three. It's where you have a home, and you have a router, a router as they call it, say it in this country, and you have TCP or UDP as the only protocol you can get through to the other end where you want to reach your protected endpoint. TCP, yeah. Some people can only get TCP through from their home, wherever they are, and get it to where they want to be. So it's come up and Librespawn supports it. Maybe not the BSD kernels, but we're hoping. So let's set up an internet, a, um, an example here. Let's use um, what is it, SetKey, which is what NetBSD comes with, the same with all the other BSDs. And you can use SetKey to just set up the IPsec tunnel or transport connection. Brute force. So here, we specify the two endpoints, we specify it should use ESP which is encapsulate and protect the traffic, we specify the algorithm, looking a bit old, specify the keys and then we specify SPD add, what exactly is going to get tunneled and in this case sorry it gets uses transport mode. Very error prone, not good for maintaining. You get things like NIST rearing their head and saying, OK, your corporation, you're going to change your keys every eight hours. Even more frequently if, you know, you've got a lot of traffic going through, not one or two bytes. And so you're not going to be doing that by talking to your mate on the phone. So enter the Internet Key Exchange daemon. It deals with all the mess and the frustration, well, I'd add some as well, of establishing two IPsec endpoints. It first establishes a, 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 its own tunnel, secure connection, and then it uses that to establish the IPsec um, tunnel proper. And does you know, and also Ike v2 doesn't suffer from the travesties of Ike v1. Something to keep in mind. If people disparage Ike, probably talking about Ike v1. So let's do, install an Ike v2 daemon. What do we do? I'm going to download and install bit Librespawn. First, just so that anyone's wondering, here's where it's going to put itself by default. User local. Someone wants to bundle up a package source. We figure, you know, stay out of their way. This way you can have a developer version, and if someone bundles it, stays well clear of it. However, it does um, put its PID in, you know, logs in var log and PID in var run, and it does install rc.d. So I can use that as well, if you want to set it up to start up when you boot the machine. So, all very straightforward. Use Pigeon, Pigeon, whatever they, however you pronounce it. Install the dependencies, clone the git repo. Currently the BSD cones only a mainline. Build it, install it, done. And then finally, start IP, you start up Librespawn. You can use the IPsec command or you can use var rc pluto, same thing, it'll start it up and make sure it's all set up. Then you do a status just to check it's running 
that'll give you a strain for the um, chew over so it's not here. Configuring Libraspawn. Thing to know about Libraspawn is one of its models is that the ipsec.conf file can be used for both ends of a connection. You might have your left, you might have your right, and that same file can be shuffled back and forth. Of course it doesn't contain keys or anything that's stored elsewhere. And so when you go looking at a Libraspawn config file, same as Strongspawn, you'll find it refers to left and right. The thing to look for is the left equals and the right equals. That pins down or orients the configuration. And so here, left is 192.1246. That lines up with the IF config the interface is going to use. And so everything else in that config file is tied to left. And it assumes the other end is right. Bit of an interesting one, but that's the way it works. So, first thing we can do, once we've got our Libraspawn running, is we do an auto, we add this um, particular configuration. It's called transport because I chose that name, it could be called anything. And do an auto up. Just to go quickly through the config, we specify left ID and right ID. These are entries in use local etc. ipsec.secret, so this is still using a pre shared key, it's not trying to do certificates. That's another battle for it, not for here. Um, specifies the authentication. Like I said, it's using a secret, the type of connection, transport. And here I've told it to use AES and SHA-1 for the um, ESP connection. For Ike, it will just use defaults. They're, sa they're pretty sane defaults, very conservative. We'll see them later. So once the connection is established, it was a good idea to check it's doing stuff and yep sure enough TCP dump shows that ESP traffic is flowing between these two endpoints life is good so part two why Libraspawn why Ike v2 so why Ike v2 it's a far simpler protocol than Ike v1 like I said you look for disparaging comments about Ike v1 there that's easy to find. Ike v2, far simpler, far more understandable. I mean, I've read the Ike v2 spec. There's only one RFC. Ike v1, there's this plethora of RFCs and you're never sure if you're reading the right one. It has, it's had extensions and it's addressed limitations of Ike v1. UDP tunneling actually works. They've extended it to TCP. It supports AEAD, authenticated encryption, AES GCM algorithms where the encryption and the authentication occur in a single pass, more efficient algorithms. So modern CPUs use those and it can use those for Ike. It does fragmentation right. Again, Ike v1, yeah, maybe not. And it's been extended with things like post quantum keys and as new algorithms turn up, they're quickly integrated into the um, RFCs and added. Of course, things need work on a BSD. There's a feature called opportunistic encryption. That's where an outgoing packet triggers a, um, the Ike daemon to go and establish an encrypted channel, and then, with encrypted channel up, traffic can flow. So it's all done on demand, and you can establish a connection with any peer out there. The authentication is done using secure DNS records. So you know, you're pretty sure you're talking who you think you are and you have a channel that's encrypted. Like I mentioned, TC TCP tunneling, because sometimes you just have to. And finally, things like mobile like, mobile phones. Phones roaming between the Wi-Fi and the um, one mobile provider, another mobile provider. You don't want your IPsec tunnel going down just because that's happened. Why Libraswan and on NetBSD? Well, here's your mandatory um, comparison chart. I've got the ones I've come up with are Raccoon, Raccoon 2, Strong Swan, Open Ike D, Libraswan. All the ones that don't actually run on NetBSD probably can be got to, so there's, that's not really a reason. But when you start to look a bit deeper, you do start to find some differences. Crypto library, Libraswan uses NSS. 
the others use SSL. You want diversity. You want to cover things from you know open you know open SSL runs into trouble. You have LibreSpot. Sorry, NSS. NSS runs into trouble. Open SSL. Cover yourself. Next one is FIPS tested. Bit unusual, but it's a, it's a good indicator of how the code base is going. If someone gets FIPS certification, they've probably done some work on the code base to clean up how it manages and handles algorithms. Because FIPS testing involves running a test suite against the crypto algorithms used in, when you're doing all this negotiation. More interesting and more recent, there's the, where is the FIPS boundary? So in LibreSwan, it's now uses purely uses NSS for its crypto. It has no built-in or internal algorithms. So its FIPS boundary boundary is NSS. When you go to get a FIPS certification, you just certify NSS. No need to try and get um, LibreSwan as well. Much simpler. Good indicator that people have been doing work. On cleaning up the cryptography side of things. Test frameworks, so Strong Swan, Libra Swan use KVM. More recently, Libra Swan's using namespaces. Same tests, just they run on Linux namespaces purely for speed. Limitations, but good speed. The last one is it keep trying to keep track of RFCs. And there, Strong Swan, Libra Swan, I give them a yes. Open like D, I think it is, but it's kind of hard to tell. Because I, I noticed it only recently added AES, seemed to add AES GCM. But I think it's progress there. Again, your horses for courses. So, now, part three, let's have a little bit more of a look at Ike V2. So, what does it take for an Ike V2 daemon to establish first? A cryptographic channel between the two Ike demons and then a cryptographic channel sorry and then the IPsec channel beneath that so it's a parent and there's a child not like IP, Ike V1 so to do it there are two exchanges the first is the Ike SANS exchange this sets up the tunnel between the two endpoints and it secures it using Diffie-Hellman straightforward nothing unusual there and then there's the ith auth exchange this is to establish trust you have a secure tunnel between two things but you don't trust the other end the ith auth exchange proves the two, to the two ends that yeah this is really who you want to be talking to and piggybacked on that exchange is enough information to set up an initial child SA or an ipsec tunnel transport so Let's go through the first exchange. First thing off, the initiator generates this Diffie-Hellman keying material, sends it off to the ARM responder, and it throws in the following. It throws in an SPI, some sort of unique identifier. It throws in your nuance. That has to be random. SPI it turns out doesn't have to be. Nuance does. It throws in a sequence number. Nuance and sequence number to stop replay attacks. Someone forgot that in an earlier version. Um, proposed cryptographic algorithms for the ICA say, you know, it's a list, what encryption, what the integrity will be, how you're going to do key expansion using pseudo random function, and the Diffie Hellman group you're going to use. And finally, there's the key material generated earlier. So off it goes. Then you get, so the responder gets this in, takes a look at it looks at these suggested cryptographic suites and picks one from the big long list it computes its own Diffie-Hellman keying material and then sends all that back and at the same time it throws in its own SPI its own Ike condition responder SPI so you now got two ends between the pair uniquely identified does the nuance does a um, sequence ID that chosen, crypto, that chosen crypto algorithm and of course that keying material. The initiator gets this, now it has enough information to set up, well first it looks at what came back and it says, hey yeah, I do like what they proposed as the final algorithm. It's not silly, it's not la la land. It completes, and then it completes this Diffie-Hellman calculation. Meanwhile, presumably the responder's probably off doing the same thing. So at this point, there's a 
secure channel between two endpoints well, they don't trust each other what happens next is the Diffie Hellman secret it gets expanded so you're now gone from some information to a huge amount of information and using that expanded information the expanded random number you can pull out all the keying material you need keying material to encrypt in both directions keying material to verify integrity so on and so forth and eventually keying material to use to establish the initial child so now the initiator using the now using the secure information it sends out it's a, it and the responders SPI the sequence ID this is now packet one and then all bundled up and encrypted enough information to do a proof of identity the IME because I know this and no one else does nuance being part of that various other things the child then in addition if he wants to establish a child information such as what algorithm the child should use and uh, other stuff such as IP address so on and so forth a basic exchange always has a child but you're doing more sophisticated things you can leave it out and the whole most of most of it is secured and tied up and safe the responder gets that in checks the packet it can verify using the information extracted from the Tiffy Hellman exchange you can verify and say yeah this is okay and if it isn't drops it like a hot potato no response nothing if you try set up an IKV2 exchange and things aren't working you're going to have to go to that responder and you're going to have to have a look at its logs you know this idea of let's be helpful in IKV1 and tell you exactly how broken we are gone so decrypts verifies the packet and if it feels like it, if it's in there it'll create the child and then it sends back its response it contains details of the child and again the responders proof of identity finally the initiator checks again the secured packet um, checks the responders identity and if it likes it it continues on if it doesn't like it it should send what's called a delete exchange secured but we can get away with not doing that although you're not meant to so let's have a look at one aspect of IKP2 so IKP2 proposals they made a lot simpler than IKP1 they flattened this data structure it's just you have a list of proposals and within a proposal there's a list of algorithms and you take any combination from that list you meant to start at the top and work your way down find the first thing that can find the first thing you like so for instance if we go back to the original like the RFC and get the algorithms out of that we got DES, 3DES, DES is obviously dead SHA-1, MD5 it's dead, TIGER I've got no clue what it even is and again for integrity SHA and TIGER and MD5 and a few mod P groups so small you can sneeze and figure out what they are Tiffy Hellman groups if you want to look at that way none of them get used anymore so things moved on Libre spawn on NetBSD and using IPsec ALG pass units just spits out the algorithms if you don't say what algorithms you should use these are the ones it's going to use ASGCM, ASCBC, SHA2 and some pretty strong Tiffy Hellman groups the DH, mysterious DH numbered ones they're probably ECP groups so and you can see Different number of different combinations. 96 combination. And the responder goes through that, compares it with what it thinks is actually reasonable, and it, the responder, makes the final decision. These are just suggestions. It's just the responder has to match up something that the initiator said, yeah, I can handle. And so that's it. But let's say you have an initiator that feels like supporting or connecting to anything. And the proposal comes at the proposal comes in and it looks like this this is ASCBC and a lot of other stuff I don't even know how many didn't even try and count how many different ways you can expand this that's a lot of combinations funny enough Libra Swan being very old and for years and years only having to you know deal with five algorithms after all that was in Ike V1 
didn't handle that so well. It was a tad slow. If you turn logging on, debug logging on, it was a bit slow at wading its way through. Oops. Uh, fixed in 2016. We tested it, did interrupt testing the Libris one itself, interrupt testing with old new versions, tried out Strong Swan, everything seemed happy, might have even tested Windows. Life was pretty good. But then you get this email. Well, as soon as the client starts negotiation like V2 with Libris one, it blows up and reloads. Hmm, probably our fault, actually my fault since I did this code. But, yeah, something smells. So, the details were in the response. So, when you accept the response and you send it back, you actually send two things. First, obviously send back the choice, the encryption algorithm, your AES, integrity algorithm, SHA, PRF, and, oh, typo, Jiffy at the Jiffy Hellman, the, mod, the group you've chosen, that goes back. And it has to be found in one of the proposals. The other thing you send back is a bit of an optimization. Uh oh. It sends back which of the proposals this came from. The index was out of bounds. The reason everyone else seemed to work is that no one trusted the index. Librespawn got back to the proposal and went, you know what, I don't trust this. I'm going to totally check it against everything that we sent and make sure it matches one. Because the new code was pretty fast. It's just, it's. Um, some constant times the number of um, proposals sent over. So if someone sends over, sorry, not proposed, you know, total number of algorithms in all the proposals. So if someone sends 20, 20 algorithms over, 20 times some constant. Pretty efficient. And all the others apparently did the same thing, except this. <clears throat> and, uh, that, I'm sure they've done the same thing to us. We keep it happy. So now we get on to part four. From old to new, what has changed in LibreSwan? LibreSwan's been around in various forms for a very long time. Okay, let's look at the history. Back in 1995, as best I can tell, John Gilmore started up the FreeSwan project. Now it had two goals. First was to encrypt the internet. And as a consequence of that, and because in 1995 you couldn't actually export crypto, you know, if you're a foreigner like me, you had to go and countries had to go and write their own crypto algorithms. You know, because you couldn't use Mozilla, so people were writing plugins to get Mozilla to do 128 bit encryption. So it was pretty, pretty silly. So Gilmore set out to encrypt the internet and he's put it, the project in, um, where is it, Canada, where I am now, and try to make, you know, that way we could, he could dodge all the US silliness with crypto laws. And things moved on, and by 2003-04, the project was winding down. It, technically, it was pretty successful, but didn't get as much traction as hoped for. There's a civil wind down, and out of the project came Open Swan and Strong Swan. They're very civil forks. Then around 2005, best I can figure out, Open Swan was ported to the BSDs. Strong Swan, I assume, picked up the code because at that point it hasn't really diverged. And things progressed. Libra Swan kind of focused on the Linuxes. Strong Swan focused more on rewriting everything. In 2012, the Open Swan team ran into a second crisis and it ended up with a further fork. You know, something about easiest way to deal with a problem project is to fork it. In this case, it was an argument over the name Strong over, over according to Lee, sorry, according to Wikipedia, it's an argument over the name Open Swan. So Paul, Wal Paul Walters and then the others, most of the others, created the project Libra Swan. From there, things progressed, features were added, NSS became the crypto library, all these changes were coming through. By about 2018, Several things have become clear. One was that CLIPS, which is one of the Linux um, kernel stacks, it was dying. Well, at least the develop developers of LibreSwan were all rebelling and trying to get rid of it. And meanwhile, Netlink, um, Netkey, Netlink, which is the other um, Linux stack, it had evolved into XFRM and it also then evolved into XFRMI. 
and it was starting to look like it would finally have Fincher equivalents to the clip stack. So it was all looking hopeful we could think the clips was going to get dumped. But that would mean Lewis one would only have one kernel stack. Not a good place to be for a project. So 2018 I kicked the old BSD codes tires just to see what had happened. Only one wheel fell off. That's impressive. Didn't take much to get transport mode working, but tunnel mode, pretty weird, something pretty weird going on. Turned out the problem wasn't actually the BSD code, it was the environment and the calls around it that had changed so radically that the way it was being called no longer made sense. So with that fixed, tunnel mode worked. 2019, Eclipse is officially announced as dead, going to be removed in 2019. 2020, Eclipse is actually removed, but still there are a few releases made that have clips because it seems to cling on for dear life. So now, we're continuing on into that 2020, we revived NetBSD, got it working. Very early code, of course, still trying to work out testing, which brings us to um, Ravi, Google Summer, Summer of Code student. And he's trying to get the BSD VMs running on our KVM test infrastructure so we can actually do proper interrupt testing of the BSD kernel stacks, end of Libris 1, and the other um, Ike demons running on the BSDs. We want to make sure our code works with all of these. So enough of the history. Why was that important? Because when you look back at old code, it's good to understand why things were written the way they were. In the case of LibreSwan, FreeSwan, the world changed. When the project was first started, everything was between home computers. Once the, someone got something working, it stayed up, never trusted it. But then in 2007, some company released an iPhone. And iPhones happened. Next thing, and ever since then, it's all been about VPNs, mobile phones, things that always crash, always reboot, net addresses that constantly change, connections that have to constantly be re-established. Very different workload, very different requirements. Of course, having a long history means you can have some old bugs. Here's a CVE. It was released as a CVE just because you meant to do this. Anyone say they don't have any CVEs, treat them with suspicion. So this one was very late after things had been authenticated and all the rest of it and you went to tear down an Ike V1 um, connection. You could potentially in theory maybe with an amazing amount of knowledge possibly come up with a dud packet. A packet would just get dropped which is why it says you know this is incredibly low vulnerability. But it's there. The interesting thing to see is FreeSwan LibreSwan, sorry, um, yeah, FreeSwan didn't have the bug. It was introduced in the first release of um, OpenSwan. And then, of course, StrongSwan, LibreSwan inherited it. StrongSwan got rid of it when it got rid of the last of the IPv1 code. And LibreSwan turned it up and got rid of it last year. Just got to watch out for that. The other thing about history is whenever you're looking at things you've got to remember you can't beat the laws of physics. These are off a laptop or a computer I got here. You can't get any faster. You might have a thousand cores. It's still going to take three milliseconds to do that Diffie-Hellman calculation. Then another eight milliseconds to finish it off. So no matter what you do you have to find 11 milliseconds to, pro to process a um, Ike and a, uh, initiate a connection for Ike. You just have to find that time. Cores and everything help, make it more parallel, but you're gonna have to use, find that time somewhere. And this means, of course, when you're looking at performance, what you're not worried about is squeezing the last little bit of performance, you know, obsessively inlining functions, obsessively using static structures, all this sort of stuff. What you're trying to do is get code that's understandable, and, wet, and anything that could be a bottleneck is well under this 11 millisecond boundary. So let's see how we went. So 
Lee Respawn's performance. When Freespawn was developed, everything was a linked list and it was obsessively worried about trying to conserve memory. Linked lists, yeah, 10 connections, 20 connections, 50 connections, 100 connections, 500 connections, 1000 connections, all constantly reconnecting, mm, starting to go run into problems. So with we'll Lee Respawn, profile the code and find as the number of connections goes up where the bottlenecks are and hash tables also to just get RSA load down cache the private key use when you're doing your signing to prove you're doing your own proof of identity you need to sign with a private key it unpack it keeps an unpacked copy which saves an RSA calculation and there's a thread pool so you can offload all the cryptography and run it on helper threads doesn't beat the laws of physics but hey 16 cores on a machine cool you can get through some things now so we went from hundreds of milliseconds per exchange down to 30 to 60 milliseconds that's with RSA still a lot of work to go but we're getting there more interesting thing for the kernel hackers is um we're pushing through so many connections now that we're running into problems with the XRFM code in Linux it's got linear algorithm problems. It can't. You go off, you say, here, add this SA, this child SA, and it wanders off into the weeds for a bit. Um, I'm sure they'll fix that one pretty quick. So what else changed over the years? Testing. Testing evolved. Back in the 90s, what did you do? You wrote your function. If you're a good programmer, you wrote a little test program. But only you used it, you then shipped the library, and if someone came back with a bug, you re enabled the test program, added a test case, rerun it, and shipped the code again. Nowadays, the tests are always built, they're always compiled. And so we went through found a hell of a lot of these little test programs and turned them all into unit tests and added them to the test framework made life a lot easier now you know you, you need to change a parsing algorithm to pass some same string there's a test case that just goes through and you're confident you haven't broken it, it refers to our pass that's critical you know someone specifies some cryptographic suite encryption prf and all the rest of it you want it to keep parsing even when someone updates their um version of libra spawn so we put that into the arm um, test framework the next bit of testing interop testing i can we talk to another ike demon can we talk to ourselves can we talk to an older version always interesting results so back in the day it was in open swan there was uml testing added so using user mode linux bit of a dog's breakfast because you had to try and fudge things up with ports and all the rest of it so it wasn't pretty pure but it did help and what it really helped with is lots and lots of test cases came out of it. You know, you got a scenario, different cryptographic algorithms at each end, do they still operate, things like that. So all these tests came out of it, but running it was a pain, very much a specialised activity. So the framework around all the tests has been replaced by KVM. There's now some scripts, you just get a machine, Linux, and... You do it, install a minimal amount of things, KVM notably, and then you do a KVM install, spins up all the KVMs for you, and everything happens on the KVM. Leave one's built on a KVM, keys are generated on a KVM, everything's on a KVM. So it's really, when it comes down to it, in theory, host agnostic. And in fact, if you want to beat the crap out of your KVM implementation, try running. LibreSwan's um, test framework. As an example, our testing machine is amazingly powerful. It's already a year old. Four cores. It has within it. It has three threads just dedicated to booting VMs, and then it's trying to run six parallel tests. And so, in a two-hour, three-hour test run, it's probably done three, two, three thousand VM reboots in other operations. So you've got leaks in your KVM code. We're going to find it, and based on history, we do find it. So, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we've got Ravi, 
adding BSD guests so we can start doing interrupt testing with that. The next step is again taking these tests. It's painfully slow to be booting up all these VMs, and so more work was it Anthony? He's got namespaces while well, on Linux working. And so now we can use the same test files, but we can use namespaces instead of constantly booting up these VMs. Way, way faster. But you can't interrupt testing. You can't have a BSD machine talking to a Linux box and talking to <coughs> a Windows box even. And we want to be able to do that still. So we're going to end up with both these systems running. More testing. FIPS rears its head again. And again, as I mentioned earlier, FIPS is a good indicator if someone's managed to get FIPS certification. They've probably spent some effort cleaning up the way the cryptographic algorithms are managed. So you go through the old code base and you find it's full of switches. I looked at a few of the um, Ike demons that are around. S um, Strong Swan, Light Libra Swan, instead of having switches and cases and bits of code it has tables it's table driven you want to add a new algorithm add a table entry done you want to um delete an algorithm because it's no longer compliant for some reason delete the table entry gone none of this wading through the code trying to find that little area where you know someone's pulled some narky hack because i don't know three des has weird keys all that code's been flushed out. So it's not FIPS that's interesting here, it's the effect trying to get FIPS certification has on a code base. So finally, we get to NetBSD and the NetBSD's back end, PF key. So there's an RFC around, I've tried to read it. It actually confuses, I find it confusing, but what I don't find confusing is the IPsec library and the set key um, commands that come with it. Simple, easy, not a problem, easy to understand. So LibreSpawn, it's using, it just grabbed, it had a very old version of um, LibIPsec, who knows where it came from. It pulled in, since it's trying to get running on NetBSD as a first case, it pulled in NetBSD's LibIPsec, and dropped it in, started using it. Nice and straightforward, simple interface. Did a bit of research, came with two interesting things. The first is NetBSD's libIPsec is still somewhat standalone. It was easy to pull in. FreeBSD's has been embedded. It's harder to pull, it would be harder based on what they've done. They've cleaned it up and integrated it into the, their build environment and their user land environment. It's, it's, it would be harder to pull out. It's unfortunate because looking at the code base, FreeBSDs had a lot more love and attention than the NetBSD code base. You know, just in the short while I looked, I found an um, out-of-bounds access that's fixed in FreeBSD. I had to go through and stomp on good old W error warnings. Mm, people got rid of those, what, 10 years ago? And finally, it doesn't matter what, whose version I used, I had to go and hack it so that I could get the print, reroute the printf calls into LibreSpawn's own logging library so that I could actually debug stuff. But with that done, things fell into place pretty quick. Debugging, easy process. You run set key, you see how set key chats to use verbose, and you can see it chatting into um, the IPsec library. And then you go look at Pluto, you turn on cryptographic debugging, which means all that naughty set hush hush secret materials in there, and you compare the output. Yeah, you know, set key works, Pluto doesn't, you know where your bug is, Pluto obviously, and you also can see this is what the call should have looked like, this is okay, how I have to go and fix it. Um, inspire, spinning back to why tunneling didn't work. It turned out that NetBSD has a call to set up. First, there's a call in the, the um, back end of Pluto to set up the um, SA, and then there's a second call, it's called eRouting, which tells it, you know, for this S, these SA, these child SAs, this is how you route your packets. And for some reason, 
Pluto was calling the it was calling set up an SA when it really meant to be doing an e-read. And once that was disentangled, things started to work. And the other cool thing about this, the really segue is, as a result of just this bit of work, we've identified chunks of code that are basically now dead. They probably did something useful once, but just no longer needed. And probably were never needed. So we're going to be doing some clean out, get things to work better. Anyway, that ends the talk, and apparently somehow we do questions. I ask C, I don't know, we'll find out. And a good thing I finished now, because it's about to turn dark.